fast is water consumption growing in America? Is the nation faced with a serious shortage? What is industry doing to meet the water crisis? Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. California's San Joaquin Valley. Without irrigation, its rich farms would lie buried in dust. Its people would vanish. For all life depends on water, which the average American uses at the rate of 60 gallons a day, not only to quench thirst and to support the health of the body, but in dozens of other ways, to keep grass green, to keep kids clean and happy. Today, America's standard of living calls for 12 times the amount of water primitive peoples require. Water is our basic ammunition against fire. And water is the basic ingredient of many of our most popular forms of recreation. Yet the growing recreational uses of water and increasing household uses are small compared with the tremendous quantities on which the nation's industrial development depends. It was on waterways that settlers and the nation's commerce first moved inland from coastal colonies. And today, waterways still make possible efficient transportation of factory products at exceptionally low cost. The use of water in manufacturing has increased some 40% in the past generation. Water performs countless tasks in factories, mines, and mills, making possible, for example, the chemical reactions that purify low-grade copper ore, as in this operation. Cooling is the biggest industrial use for water, while one of the most familiar is spray painting. The waterfall catches and carries off the overspray. Another major use of water, the generation of electric power. Like the individual then, America's unsurpassed industrial economy could not exist without water, our most vital natural resource. The supply might seem to be endless. From the oceans of the world, the sun evaporates and lifts into the skies about 80,000 cubic miles of water each year, moving more than one-fourth of it over the land surfaces of the continents onto which it falls as rain or snow. In total volume, this unending circulation is constant, but in other respects, it is quite unreliable, since nature is fickle in her selection of time and place and in the quantities she releases from the clouds. The history of man is filled with droughts and floods which have killed millions and forced mass migrations. As a result, we have had to learn how to control the flow of water as it rushes down and back to the sea again, completing its cycle. We have had to learn how to manage it, to make the most of it. This is a report on such measures, on water conservation in which industry, a leading user, plays a leading role, helping us utilize to the full extent a natural resource that has influenced most profoundly the shape of civilization. Two extremes of the water problem are illustrated simultaneously in a semi-desert area of our own southwest. On the one hand, it shows the effects of drought, earth that lies barren because it holds no water. On the other hand, it contributes to floods. Because the land refuses to absorb what little rain does fall, the water will run along the surface, picking up flood characteristics. The test shows the soil to have virtually no ability to absorb moisture. But industry shows one way to help correct the situation with a device which punches holes in the hard pan surface. Come the next rain, thousands of tons of water will be absorbed quickly. Here in western Oregon, rainfall is much heavier, but there's still a problem. So, experts are called from a local power company in this case, the visitors are employed by a firm that believes its obligation to the community 
goes far beyond its basic function of supplying electric power. The experts know that the problem here is a bunching of rain, too much at the wrong times, not enough at others. And they're skilled at correcting the situation through carefully planned storage and irrigation systems. After terrain is studied and soil analyzed, distances over which pipes will have to be laid are carefully measured off. The water plan for this farm centers on a stream that runs through the property. The completed project includes a dam, carefully planned to capture and store just the amount of water needed. Heavy rainfall, once lost in runoff, will be held back now, saved for use when skies are cloudless. A pump will lift the water up an incline to field level. Result, increased farm prosperity, better living for the whole community through water conservation. This dam and others displayed in a model are among many constructed by Southern California Edison Company to make use of the same water over and over again. The series of dams and powerhouses starts high in the mountains, converting the falling water into power at various stages as it falls, and finally releasing it to irrigate the valley below. Also in California, the Laguna Municipal Reservoir is lined with waterproof asphalt as a conservation measure. The lining consists of reinforced molded asphalt panels cut to lengths which can range from 5 to 15 feet. The panels are eased up the sloping walls by a winch and sealed in place with a special adhesive that forms a permanent bond, thus blocking seepage which sometimes accounts for the loss of as much as two-thirds of the volume of water in storage or in transit. Here, the mastic adhesive is applied. Finally, firm contact is ensured by a short stroll up the wall and the job is finished. In a storage system that also keeps the water covered, to prevent evaporation and thus further ensure that waste is held to an absolute minimum. A chemical covering to retard evaporation is the technique being employed in this experiment at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. It's one of 150 chemicals the experts here have tested on water surfaces ranging in area up to hundreds of acres. After taking careful readings of humidity, wind velocity, and other conditions that might affect their experiments, they have found that a substance known as hexadecanol can help reduce evaporation by 18%, a saving of enormous importance. The organic compound is completely harmless and has the ability to spread quickly over the water surface in the form of a protective film just one molecule thick. With distribution easily accomplished by means of floating, chemical-filled cylinders or rafts, another victory in the fight to conserve water. And here's the story of still another skirmish won by industrial ingenuity. At a New Jersey frozen food processing plant that uses more than 10 million gallons of water every day, this water, when it becomes waste, is far from being poisonous. But because of the bits of food and other matter it contains, it cannot be dumped into public streams. So the problem is how to make it pure again. And the solution in this case is simply by pumping it back into the earth from which it came. For the purpose, the company turned its attention to a nearby woods and found that there the water is soaked up as fast as it's pumped in, millions of gallons a day, and still the forest drinks it up like a blotter causing it to filter down 200 feet through layers of sand and gravel before emerging finally by way of springs as clear, pure water, ready once again to serve the entire community. The ability of trees to draw water deep into the ground and to hold it there means a close relationship, of course, between water conservation and the conservation of our forests. The renewing of the one always tends to help renew the other. 
so that the planting of trees plays an important part in the increase of our underground water supply. Mass reforestation, sponsored here in Wisconsin by power and paper companies, and in many other parts of the country by industries of various kinds, is among the most practical of the many programs geared to our increasing need for water. A fortunate side effect, of course, is the continuation of the perpetual harvest of trees. In its operations, the pulp and paper industry is a big user of water, but in research projects like those in progress here at the Institute of Paper Chemistry in Appleton, Wisconsin, the pulp and paper manufacturers push on toward even greater accomplishments in water conservation than those already achieved. The industry spends more than $10 million annually in construction of new facilities for purification and conservation of water, and expenditure over and above the cost of operating and maintaining existing purification facilities. Three-fourths of the water it uses is recirculated and reused. That means pulp and paper mills without such investment would require four times as much water as they do at present. Not so practical now, but holding perhaps the greatest promise of all for the future is industry's many-sided search for ways to purify salt water economically. Membranes alternately charged with negative and positive electricity are the basis of one approach. When water is passed through the membranes here at Ionics Incorporated, the salt is drawn off, leaving a purified liquid. This principle already is being used to purify brackish water sufficiently for irrigation and even for drinking. And as quantity production of these devices reduces costs, as demand for pure water increases still further, we may all eventually be watering our crops and drinking pure water taken directly from the sea without waiting for nature to purify it, freeing us from nature's whims about the best time and place for distribution. Efficient industrial use and reuse of water now available, together with the continuing search for new supplies, help bring crops to land once considered marginal or even useless. But our growing population with its increasingly higher living standards means more and more need for water, and thus for greater water conservation, in which industry leads the way. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers. What's the latest service in service stations? Why does a cage make a tractor more useful? How can a curtain of air keep out wintry blasts? Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Home at last at the end of a hot, steamy afternoon. It's 95 outside. But inside, what a different story. For this is one of the growing number of American homes equipped with air conditioning. Too cold, the same unit will warm the air. Too moist or dry or dusty, there's equipment to handle those problems too, permitting us to live with the weather. Insulation is an important part of the story, protecting the man-made climate inside. And this is a new kind of heater, the portable forerunner of much larger radiant glass panels, one day expected to provide enough heat economically to warm a whole house. Not only atmospheric conditions, but some of the devastating effects of violent storms now can also be efficiently controlled with the help of lightning rod systems like the one being installed here. 
This is a report on some of the many ways in which industry is eliminating the discomforts and inconveniences caused by the climate in years gone by. Among the industries that contribute to our constantly improving ability to control our personal environment, textile manufacturers play an important role, increasing the warmth of winter garments and the coolness of summer garb. Here at Goodall Sanford Incorporated, for example, in Maine, the Palm Beach fabric that for years was made of Angora fleece mohair and long staple cotton has been markedly improved. The addition of nylon and rayon fibers makes the fabric even cooler and much more resistant to wrinkles. In Seattle, the Gensolite Corporation blends fibers of wool and acetate to form one of the insulating materials now widely used to line protective clothing. Permanent air cells are created by the two fibers in combination. The fabricators who use the insulating liner in sports and foul weather garments usually sandwich it between layers of wind repellent cloth. The quilting compresses the springy batting to a fraction of its normal thickness, thus further increasing its ability to protect us from the elements. A product of industrial research during World War II, it's now finding widespread applications under much happier conditions, on ski slopes and on camping trips. In many activities, the problem of the air around us is not so much its temperature or humidity as it is the odor which it carries. The aroma of tons of onions, for example, fried every month in this chicken liver processing plant in White Plains, New York. To solve the problem before the neighbors could complain, this firm, like others faced with similar situations, turned to an organization that specializes in counteracting odors. Chem Incorporated of New York City makes bad odors its business. Tackling the onion problem, its experts simply tried it out for themselves, frying onions in half dozen closed rooms with which the laboratory is equipped. At the same time, they exposed in each room a different deodorizing compound or combination of compounds. The most effective counteractant was then determined, as it inevitably must be, by the human nose. The theory of odor counteraction is best illustrated by nature. Sniff some rancid butter. The senses recoil. Then sniff a freshly cut orange. Very pleasant. Now put the two close together, and when the proper balance is achieved, the result is nothing. No odor whatsoever. In tackling a special odor problem, standard procedure, as with the onions, is to recreate in the lab conditions similar to those that caused the offending odor. Here, a miniature pilot plant generates a duplicate of the exhaust emitted by the stacks of a Portland cement works. Analysis of the precipitated solids leads to the solution of the cement company's problem. To counteract the odor that inevitably results in an operation of this kind, only a small amount of a special substance had to be injected into the stacks at ground level. The odor still exists, but in combination with the vaporized counteractant, it no longer is perceptible to the senses. This plant is located on the shores of one of the Great Lakes. So in working out a solution to its odor problem, engineers took advantage of that fact. When operating automatically, the system shuts off while the wind is blowing out over the lake, then turns on again whenever a wind shift sends the stack exhaust, mostly steam, back in the direction of populated areas. The plant has become a more welcome neighbor. Here's another prospect for complaints from the neighbors, if it has any neighbors at all. A sewage disposal plant where fertilizer is extracted and residual liquids processed so they can safely be dumped into public streams. Even the odor generated here can be neutralized with a formula designed for the specific purpose and dispersed into the atmosphere by means of a compressed air pache gun. 
The environment of sewage plants once made the neighborhood submarginal for living purposes. But with the current population pressure on suburban areas, this shouldn't be and needn't be. Land values in hundreds of localities are increasing because the odor that once afflicted them has been removed. The amount of space that needs to be conditioned for our comfort often is very small, as in a car on a very hot day. Many cars, of course, carry their own cooling equipment these days, just as they carry heaters. But for those that don't have coolers, this enterprising service station provides one, temporarily. In two minutes, the air is changed nine times, providing a much more pleasant atmosphere for an hour or so afterward. An application of air conditioning with implications far more significant gets set for a tryout here at Open Gate Experimental Farms in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Under the tractor's transparent hood, Cockshut Farm Equipment Company has installed a cooler for summer work and for winter, a powerful heater. The new model was designed to put an end to the days when a farmer had to work from sunup to sundown in scorching heat and freezing cold. Inside the cab, protected from sun, rain, snow, and dust, the operator now can create his own climate. This compact unit is the air conditioner. With noise shut out, the cab can also be equipped with a radio to bring in market news and weather reports. By eliminating time lost because of bad weather, the machine could save a farmer as many as 30 working days a year. School days, too, are far more healthful now because drafts have been eliminated by units like the one we see being demonstrated. Fresh air entering is heated, filtered, circulated, then ejected upward along the bottom of the window side of the room. This creates what is known as a kinetic barrier, an upward flowing wall of warm air that prevents hot spots, cold spots, drafts, and dead areas inherent in the design of modern classrooms with their generous window areas. With the help of research by the train company, this Wisconsin school provides an atmosphere conducive to study, an atmosphere in which the three R's may be absorbed without the interference of wintry drafts. Scientifically controlled air works for maximum health, comfort and economy. Controlled air actually has eliminated the main doors at this supermarket in suburban Cincinnati. The cold is kept outside, the warmth inside, by nothing more than a curtain of air. Not a blast that would send hats flying, just a gentle stream flowing from louvered vents on the top, down into a grill work in the floor, and then up through the wall for purification, reheating, and recirculation. By manipulating simple controls, the vents can be adjusted so that the airflow counteracts any kind of wind or weather outside. A product of St. Louis Air Curtain Company, the device makes shopping a lot easier for package-laden customers and employees alike. And of course, it leads inevitably to speculation about a future in which we may be able literally to live outdoors in perfect comfort. Meanwhile, the next best thing is the Southdale Regional Shopping Center in Minneapolis, where an illusion of big outdoor spaces has been achieved in a contemporary version of the old town square. Here, springtime is perpetual, even in sub-zero Minnesota winters, because the area is covered by a roof that lets the sun shine in, but not the snow. Two levels of shops connected by escalators surround the court itself, and interior streets and lanes are lined by still more stores. Side by side on a normal street, the businesses here would extend nearly a mile through the snowdrifts. Concentrated under one roof, they're only a few seconds apart. Visitors often check their coats just inside one of the main entrances, using lockers placed there for the purpose. For here, the weather, like police and fire protection, is centrally controlled from this electronic headquarters. Helping to protect shoppers and merchants alike, T 
TV gives Southdale's weather monitors a hundred eyes, letting them keep tabs on conditions in all parts of the big center, on streets, in shops, or in the courtyard, which often features exhibits and displays like antique auto shows. Designed to ensure the convenience and pleasure of perfect weather all year round, it's a modern marketplace for which the forecast is always fair and warm. So far, so good. But industrial researchers already are far along with work on the larger problem of controlling the weather itself. By blowing his moist breath into a home freezer, then scraping dry ice into it, Dr. Vincent Schaefer, in a simple experiment at the General Electric Laboratories, demonstrated years ago the possibilities of artificially inducing snow or rain. The dry ice hangs in streaks until the researcher whips it up. Then, watch the snow particles begin to form. Using this principle, weather makers actually are at work today endeavoring to make Mother Nature do their bidding, bringing us closer to the time when we'll be able to control the weather outside as effectively as we now control it inside our homes and factories. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade. A service of the National Association of Manufacturers. Do avocados grow on bushes, trees, or vines? The day's business. Why are some successful stores growing smaller? What factories are part-time recreation rooms? Industry on Parade. A brand new look at our America. Produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. An avocado nursery at Goulds, Florida. No, you won't see any avocados growing here. It'll be three years or more before the big seed of this delicious fruit can produce a tree that will bear fruit of its own. Notice the pit has begun to sprout. Planted in a special pot, it'll get the closest care and attention here in the nursery during the many weeks that precede transplanting out of doors. Through extensive crossbreeding, they've developed strains of avocado trees that they know will produce good fruit and lots of it. So rather than gamble on a seedling that may waste five years of costly cultivation and then prove worthless, they take the seedling when it has reached the proper height and graft onto it the bud of a stock that's been tried and tested. Expert horticulturists slit the stem and slide in the bud, wrapping it firmly in place. In this way, one good seedling of a proven variety can be used to produce half a dozen or more avocado trees, almost certain to bear good fruit. After the transplanted bud has had a chance to resume its growth on the new stem, the parent plant is pruned back. Fresh cut is painted to prevent sap from escaping. It's a new plant. Now it goes to the slat house, there to absorb just the right amount of Florida sunshine, water, and plant nutrients. A little older, and the plants, now small trees, go outside. At this point, they're ready to be reset in groves. So now they begin the slow, steady march toward maturity. And why are they planted so far apart? Here's why. Here are some mature avocado trees being harvested. It's been 28 years, though, since these giants were seedlings. Florida's avocado industry has been busy even longer than that, studying the crop, 
working over the soil, trying out new strains, opening up more and more acres until today, the state produces more than 18 million pounds of the fruit each year, second only to California. That's in quantity, of course. We'll let the two states carry on their own argument about comparative quality. Big flatbed trucks pull up to receive the harvest of the pickers. The first fruit ripen about the 1st of July and the last the 1st of February. That's a pretty good spread for any crop. But the avocado growers are still experimenting with ways of preserving their product. The fruit doesn't take cooking very well, so it can't be canned, and for the time being, they're resigned to hustling the crop to the customers, fresh from the trees. Hauled to the packing plant, the avocados are cleaned, graded for size, and scrutinized for blemishes or imperfections of any kind. Even though a misshapen fruit may be perfectly edible, in fact, delicious, it won't be passed by the examiners. The rule is only fruit that's perfect in every way. Avocados are not a particularly perishable food. They can take any ordinary temperatures and their tough skins give plentiful protection against contamination but they can be affected by bruises, so they're carefully packed in Excelsior. The tops are nailed on by machine. If avocado production continues to grow as it has, this fruit, before too long, may be regarded more or less as one of the staples of the American diet. It's long since been just that in some Latin American countries, where it's sometimes called the poor man's butter, partly because of its texture, partly because of its dietetic properties. Here, though, the avocado has achieved its greatest fame as a salad fruit, prized for its delicate nut-like flavor. There are any number of ways to serve it, but here's how the true avocado connoisseur loves it best. Industry averages about four cents profit on each dollar of sales. Half of this profit is paid out to shareholders, the people who risk their savings to buy machines, buildings, and supplies. The two cents that is left is plowed back into the business to pay for more plants, machines, and tools. This is the money which helps the company grow, turn out more products, and provide more jobs. With about a million new jobs needed every year, it's important that industry continues to make a profit so that money will be available for America's expansion. Industry on Parade drops in at the Blanco Glass Company in Middleton, West Virginia to watch some fine craftsmen producing decorative glassware by what is known as the freehand or offhand method, which is to say, the glassware is almost completely handmade. Here we see how a piece of molten glass, with about the consistency of taffy, starts through a long series of operations that will transform it into a vase. The tools of the glassmaker are simple ones, hollow tubes through which to blow air into a blob of glass gathered from the furnace. Apple wood instruments to capture and exploit the fluid curves, the smooth, round lines that glass naturally assumes with just a little assistance. Apple wood is used because it chars slowly and smoothly, leaving an ash that won't cause scratches. Here's an odd-shaped blob of glass that will become a vase, shaped like a... Well, let's wait and see what shape it will take. The only molds used in the plant are also of hand-carved apple wood. Blow and turn. Blow and turn. Between most of these steps, the glass is reheated to bring it back to just the right plasticity. Now, our vase to be is flattened slightly.
Is it a plane? Is it a bird? Is it a fish? Well, as a matter of fact, it is a fish, or will be after they've added eyes and fins, split the tail, and cut off the glass that adheres to the tube. The mouth will be ground smooth, and the job is done. Just one of hundreds of samples of the unusual artistic glass products that are a combination of a craft that's ages old and the achievements of 20th century designers and chemists specializing in glass. A segment of a shopping center at Manhasset, Long Island that's been labeled the Miracle Mile. Perhaps they call it that because here, shoppers can find a place to park their cars. But adequate parking space is just one feature of the shopping centers now sprouting up all over the land, rapidly changing the entire American pattern of retail sales. Another is the free hand the architect can have in designing stores and shops that are pleasant to look at and easy to wander through. Here's a center at Smithtown, New York. It has the usual variety of department stores, clothiers, jewelers, five and ten, everything to allow for one-stop shopping. A novel feature, though, is one of the nation's first self-service drug stores, run just like a supermarket. You walk around, help yourself to whatever you need, and pay the bill at a checkout counter. Shopping centers became inevitable when Americans streamed out of the cities into the suburbs following World War II. Theories about how big the centers should be and what services they should offer are still being formulated by men like architect Lathrop Douglas, here watching construction of his latest project at Yonkers, New York. Douglas argues that a center should encourage competition, and so he's building two of everything, two banks, two department stores, and so on. We customers can count on the continued benefits of better service and lower prices that always result from free competition. There isn't a day that goes by that you don't see or hear of some new or improved product on the market. Industry is constantly on the search for new products or trying to improve those already in existence. To do this, industry spends more than one billion dollars a year in research employing thousands of engineering and scientific personnel. This research benefits all of us in more and better products at prices we can afford to pay. Industry's research laboratories are constantly working to discover tomorrow's product today. A sprawling West Coast aircraft factory its 26,000 employees are scattered through buildings that cover more than 230 acres. Lunchtime in a vast place like this could mean wholesale indigestion, should all these workers have to race to the nearest exit and walk many blocks in search of food and relaxation. But North American aviation employees barely stir from the job, for the company has converted the broad aisles of its plants into hidden playgrounds, and after workers have eaten lunches brought from home, or served up by mobile canteens, they take to ping pong table or horseshoe court. The horseshoes are of rubber, but you have to have that old eye just the same. Too bad. Another favorite shuffleboard, like taking a Caribbean cruise during the lunch hour. And the hidden playground idea means that a worker's lunch hour is all his own. Here are some players who need all the time they can get. Their games go on for weeks at a time. There's no need to start easing back to the workbench five or ten minutes before the break ends. The bell rings, and 30 seconds later, they're ready to start wrestling anew with the mysteries of aerodynamics. The hidden playgrounds become hidden once more as the ping pong table returns to its regular job of holding blueprints. The workers, too, are better equipped to go back to their vital job, of turning out those F-86 Sabre jets and their latest, the Super Sabre F-100. Looks like even horseshoes, chess, and shuffleboard have a part in our national defense. <laughs> 